They say they're my bank. They've confirmed my postcode and my account number. They say they've spotted suspicious activity on my account. They could be my bank. Now they've asked me to move my money to a safe account they've set up. That tells me they are not my bank. My money? My info? I don't think so. A genuine bank will never contact you asking you to move your money to a safe account. Take five. This is a global original podcast. Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project designed chiefly to allow me to spend more time than is normally available in an interview format with people that I find fascinating. Although this week I am both daunted by the well, the scale of the subject matter that we could cover and uncharacteristically intimidated oh. by the interviewee. So, Salman Rushdie, many thanks indeed for doing this. Thank you. I'm really not scary. <laughs> well, I, I'm afraid I have to be the judge of that. Um, I, I'm encouraged by the fact that you, you describe your most deplorable trait or the trait you most deplore about yourself as talkativeness. As an interviewer, I'm encouraged by that. Um, for an interview that often runs through the life and times before we arrive on the most recent work. I'm discouraged by the fact that you find yourself increasingly drawn to the sort of 18th century novelists model of not really wanting to reveal much about yourself. So where, where, where's the tension there between the reticence and the talkativeness? Well, I mean, I like to talk about things other than myself. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that that 18th century model is quite interesting, you know, um, I mean, as I, as I wrote in one of the essays in, in the book, um, if you look at the title pages of some of the most famous books of the 18th century, you know, Gulliver's Travels, Robinson Crusoe, uh, Tristram Shandy, uh, the author's names are not there. I mean, the Gulliver's Travels pretends to be written by Gulliver, uh, and, and, uh, Tristram Shandy pretends to be written by him, the fictional character, and and uh, and and similarly, you know, with with uh, the others. So they they seemed to be a thing that was going on that books could be very famous. I mean, these were very successful books in, at the in their time, maybe the most successful books of the time, you know. Um, and yet the authors could remain very almost unknown. I mean, people, I guess, had some knowledge that Jonathan Swift. Uh, of who he was and uh, and that you know he he was a dean and he that he had wrote other stuff under his own name uh, and but I mean for example Daniel Defoe loved to play games with with authorship you know so uh, he wrote under something like two hundred pseudonyms uh, I mean he published more than five hundred things in his life you know I mean I mean not all of these were full-length books, a lot of these were like polemical pamphlets and things like that, but, but he loved to make up names for himself and, and to pretend that he was the author, you know, so when he, even when he wrote Moll Flanders, which is about a female character, he pretended that she had written the book. Um, I, I kind of like that, that books can be famous, but authors can be private. I kind of like that thought. Well, I mean, for one very, very obvious reason, I suppose. But uh, so, so Defoe was meta before meta was even a thing, um, in, in a way. Yeah. Um, the other thing that struck me when I was preparing to talk to you is that interviews are usually about either what you have done or what has been done to you. Whereas in your case, even a sort of cursory glance at your Wikipedia page, the, the dichotomy is almost 50-50 in, in terms of what you have done and then what infamously was done to you. Yeah. I'm a little over what was done to me, you know, because uh, <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, it took it took up a big chunk of my life, uh, uh, you know, a decade or, or a bit more than a decade. Um, but it's 30 years ago. Mm. You know, and, and, and I really I really feel not anymore quite like the person to whom that happened, you know, yes. and, uh, uh, because I've had all this life, you know, since then. Um, and. In a way, when I wrote the memoir, my memoir, Joseph Anton, one of the reasons I wrote it in the third person, which is a weird decision, is because I did feel not quite like the person I was writing about. You know, that, that, I, mean, I, I, mean, I wrote the book quite a long time after all those e events had come to an end. You know, the events around the satanic verses had come to an end. Um, and I felt that the person that I was writing about was in a very different frame of mind, a, a very different 
part of his life, you know, uh, was under a kind of stress and, and feelings and, and all kinds of dark feelings. You know, that by the time I wrote the book, I wasn't like that. You know, I was in, I was in kind of a much better place. So it actually allowed me to be objective about that younger self uh, in a way to treat it as a third person character. There's a fondness to it. Though that you discover a warmth for your younger self, I think in Joseph Anton. Yeah, I mean, I you know sometimes I'm, I'm sometimes I'm more impressed by my younger self than my present self. You know, um, <laughs> I mean, I remember when I was writing Midnight's Children. You know, nobody knew who I was. I'd had one book published that had been, to put it mildly, unsuccessful, uh, and and I was stuck working part time in an ad agency. Uh, and I had no way of knowing if I'd ever escaped that, you know, and, 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 and I was writing this, this enormously long book, um, which was, you know, very ambitious without really even being certain that it would be published, you know, uh, 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 let alone find any kind of readership. And if I look back at that kid, I mean, I was like 27, 28 when I started writing that book. You know, and 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 kind of thirty-two in a bit when I when I finished writing it. Mm. I mean, just the the determination, you know, to 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 get that done. I think it's I, I I'm proud of him, you know, because I think if not because you know I I left university in 1968. Uh, Midnight Children was published in 1981. Mm. That's like twelve years of struggle, you know. Um, yeah. And if now somebody said to me, how about spending the next 12 years doing something without any guarantee that you'll be any good at it by the end of that, you know, <laughs> I would probably not have done that. You know, I would not do that now. So, so I'm kind of rather proud of him that he persevered. I think we've already established, well, I'm slightly daunted by the amount of subject matter that we could cover in the course of, of yeah. one interview, because you've glossed over several bits already. You were actually a very successful advertising writer. I mean, you so, came up with some of the, the more totemic slogans of the time. I was medium successful, yeah. Um, uh, the, um, yes, the, the, I guess the, the two that people know about is the, the Aero chocolate bars kind of Adora bubble stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and the um, naughty but nice stuff for cream cakes. Um, both of which had real trouble being accepted because I remember pitching the naughty but nice stuff to the cream cakes client. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, look, this is, you're telling people that cream cakes make them fat. And I said, look, I said, you know, they know that. <laughs> I said, you should concentrate on the but nice. Uh, anyway, it took a long time to get that through. So, and, and so, I mean, it was, you know, it was kind of fun in a way, but I always saw it as a means to an end. You know, I mean, advertising was really different in those days uh, because it, it, it was more free form. They're actually, they're actually big agencies, you know, they liked having kind of oddball creative people working part time. You know, um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the novelist Faye Weldon worked at Ogilvy's at the same time as me and, uh, and you know, like that. So, I mean, Frank Rodham, before he directed Quadrophenia uh, and invented MasterChef, you know, was 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 working part time at Ogilvy's, and they liked that. You know, they thought it brought added a kind of frisson. You know, um, and so I was able to get a job working sometimes two, sometimes three days a week, uh, and it paid the rent and it allowed me. I mean, that's you know, midnight children took five years. It's, it's the opposite then of what you describe as that sort of fondness for the maverick. Is is the opposite of algorithm driven culture, isn't it, or algorithm driven media? Yeah, it really is. I mean, I think it's, the world has changed a lot, and that that, that kind of uh, way of making a living, in a way, is sort of not available anymore. You know, um, to, to have a sort of portfolio and to do the day job while you're getting on with the business of the. The, the, yeah, the I, mean, I, would, I, would, I always like to work the back end of the week. I, I, so I'd work like Thursday and Friday, you know, and, and I'd, I, remember, I used to have this habit that I'd come home on Friday night and I'd have a very long bath and okay. like wash capitalism off me <laughs> <laughs> and then have four days, sometimes five days of being an artist, as I thought, you know, um, the other way around, I didn't need a bath. Well, you didn't need to wash off the, 
No, I didn't need to watch the that. culture to, to get back into the rat race. Um, you, you mentioned your fondness for yourself at that that age, that generation. What, what about even earlier? What about what about the very small Salman Rushdie growing up in? Well, I mean, in I grew. Yeah, I, I had. A, I actually, unlike the hero of Midnight's Children, who has rather a troublesome childhood, yes. I mean, rather a troubled childhood. My memory is of having a very happy childhood. You know, I, I, I lived in a, I mean, the city I lived in, I really loved. I mean, Bombay in the, as it was then, uh, Bombay in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, you know, was a different place than it is now. First of all, it was smaller, but it was also a much more open city, much less kind of sectarian, no kind of religious dissension in the way that there is now. Um, so I had a great time as a kid there. It's also was a very cosmopolitan city. You know, so, so just in my immediate neighborhood, you know, the kids that I played with came from everywhere. You know, there were, there were English, Swedish, Japanese, uh, and then kids from all over India, you know, from, because Bombay is this magnet where people come from all over the country. You know? So Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Parsis, you know, um, and all of that seemed available to all of us, you know, and, and it was fun. That's, I loved it. And I was a booky kid. I was a bookish kid. You know, I was the kid with his nose in a book. Uh, I was never, to say the least, I was never very good at sports. <laughs> <laughs> stories that you, it was stories you loved rather than text. Yeah, I did. And my, you know, my parents were great at encouraging reading. And, and I think one of the smart things they did was not to force me to read only good books. Yes. So, so if I was reading like Batman comics, they didn't say don't read that trash, you know. And and so so what it did is it gave me first of all it gave me a deep knowledge of of deep, of Dell Comics of the nineteen fifties, which I can you know I can tell you the difference between red and yellow kryptonite, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, green and yellow kryptonite rather. Uh, red is a whole other game. Yeah. Um, um, but I also I just got the reading bug, you know, and and so I just read a lot and. Mm -hmm. When did you realize you were clever? I mean, I was good at school, you know. Uh, I, I, I was always kind of at or near the top of the class. Uh, somewhat to the irritation of my sisters, uh, who, who said they would have to come to the school speech day in order to clap every year. <laughs> <laughs> There's a warmth towards family in, 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 in all of your work, but... And, and that's your, your nieces and your, your sons in, in the new work. They pop up quite frequently. But the, um, the interesting lesson I drew from it was actually in the Carrie Fisher essay in the new book, in, in your, your repudiation of the famous thesis at the heart of when Harry met Sally. And you think that because you had three sisters growing up, you always had the ability to see women as friends rather than as yeah. um, objects of desire, you know, whether fulfilled or not. You know, I've always, all my life, I've had more women friends than men friends. And I mean, I'm not talking about people I had anything romantically to do sure. with. You know, I'm just talking about... There's been plenty of that as well, of course. I mean, some of that, you know. I mean, I mean I'm, you know, I'm going to be 74 this year. It's been, I've, had a, I've had some time. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always had a lot of really seriously good women friends, you know. And, and um, I mean, sometimes I, I tell myself that I need to go and date a few more boys, you know, so I could, I need to have a few, need to have a few more male friends. Um, and, but it's always, I don't know, I've loved it, you know, and, and, and it's part of, I think, I mean, I think myself that if I look at my own work, that the women characters are very often more interesting to me than the, than the men characters, you know, um, and, uh, and I'm kind of proud of that. I think, you know, I, I like it that I've managed to write a, num a, a number of women who women really like, you know. Mm. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the things when the last novel, Kishat, came out, I know there were one or two kind of, kind of let's say, famously spiky English critics um, who, who actually melted a little bit and really liked the way in which the women were drawn. And I thought, yeah. well, that's, you know, that's hard to persuade those people. So they, uh, I was pleased. I didn't get vaccinated. I did get really ill. I did three days in bed and then about a week on the sofa. I didn't taste a thing for about a month. I still don't do stairs if I can help it. I didn't think it would be this bad. If you're unvaccinated, 
you're much more likely to be hospitalised with COVID-19 than if you've had both doses of the vaccine and the booster. Get vaccinated now at nhs.uk slash COVID vaccination. We're living in an era where a lot of great men of letters, I suppose most obviously recently Roth, they've had the opposite real... Yeah, I don't know. Well, Philip, Philip, you know, I knew Philip a little bit, but I mean, Philip's biographer is the one in trouble. Yes, of course, but the book is, is, is unforgiving of, of Roth's attitude to women as well. You know, I haven't read the book. Okay. I, mean, I actually haven't even looked at it, but I, I know people who knew Philip Roth quite well and who have read the book and, and who found it very annoying in its concentration on, okay. on his, on, on, you know, to put it bluntly, the activities of his penis rather than of his mind. Um, and Philip was a very generous man an astonishingly generous. He would, he, he would uh, buy cars for his housekeeper when she needed, when she couldn't get, to, when she couldn't travel. And he would send ten thousand dollars to people who needed money for medical expenses. And um, and and he was really an astonishingly open-hearted man. And the thing is, he, you know, he had a lot of. I mean, he was. He had, he had women liked him. You know, uh, and there's never been any suggestion. I mean, he was he could be he could be a shit, sure, uh, and, and and he could break up with people in a cruel way, which, which you know so, sometimes he did, but but he he was somebody who loved women and women loved, you know, and there's never been any such suggestion of improper behaviour no. of him you know, of him kind of doing something to a woman the woman didn't want him to do. You know? Well, I, I was thinking more in, in i mean you're absolutely right of course but it, it was more about that ability to inhabit the head of a woman which perhaps if you're more interested in other parts of her body you, well, you wouldn't be able to write in the way that you have so we're back to that platonic idea because i found the carrie fisher essay yeah. I, I hope you're not offended when i say it's surprisingly moving i was really surprised by how moving it was because it it, it spoke of the sort of friendship that i think everyone should aspire to in your case it just happened to be with princess leia yeah, I know it was a. It was a. I mean, I loved Carrie. You know, yes, and, it comes and, across and, in every every line. And uh, and my family loved her. She became very close to both my sons and mm. so on. You know, she was a great friend. I mean, she knew how to be a friend. You know, and it was important to her to. And around her in 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 Los Angeles, there was this kind of very eclectic group of people that she had gathered around herself as kind of her tribe. You know, um, one of whom was Helen Fielding, who wrote Bridget Jones and and, um, and Tracy Ullman and uh, you know people like that. They were all kind of brilliant. The one, the only thing they had in common is that they were all very funny. Um, and I mean, dinner at Carrie's house was just, I mean, you came away aching with laughter. <laughs> and it's what I miss most about her is the is the is the comedy. It's also what I miss most about Christopher Hitchens, you know, uh, 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 about whom there's a lot to say, you know, which is, but, but the thing is, he was enormously funny. Um, and, and evenings spent with him were also like that. They were kind of hilarious. And I lost my two funniest friends in a way. Of course, yes. H Hitchens was the man that popped into my mind when you mentioned a paucity of, of male friends, actually, because yeah. that, that's a well-documented friendship. It, 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 it struck me when you said that about the humour, that the, the scepticism towards the public intellectual in this country mm. um, perhaps explains why so many of them end up living elsewhere, like, like you and like Hitchens and, and, and like Amos. But um, I don't know if the English sensibilities acknowledge how funny very, very clever people can be. It's, that, that perhaps is part of the reason for the resistance to public intellectuals in England. I, don't, I think, you know, truthfully, I think there's less resistance to public intellectuals in England than there is in America. Oh, really? That surprises yeah, me. I mean, put it like this. If there's a general election in England, hmm. somebody might ask, you know, Ian McEwan to write something about what he thinks. Yes, true. Uh, in America, it wouldn't occur to anybody to ask, say, Don DeLillo you know, to, okay. uh, to write about, you know, uh, the media, even the kind of serious mainstream media here, don't seem to feel that it's interesting to their readers to have um, to have like serious writers other than other than journalists and and regular opinion writers, you know, um, write about current affairs. So there is here much more of a kind of uh, kind of domination of the commentariat. You know, okay. you, yes. you have to be like professionally a commentator. 
in order to comment. You know, and, and if you're something else, if you're a novelist, then it's not really thought that you have anything to say. You know, I mean, so I think England is some, I mean, in Europe, I mean, France, for example, it's, it's the opposite, you know. Sure. Um, and I think England's somewhere in between. I mean, it is geographically in between France and America, but I think in this matter also, it's somewhere in between. And perhaps that's why, I mean, the new, your new book, Languages of Truth, a collection, it's not just essays, it's also lectures, speeches that you've given as an academic. So that, that provides a hinterland, perhaps, between... Yeah, and I mean, not, you know, the way you write a lecture is not the way you write an essay, you know. So, so although some of these pieces began, and they've had, if you like, a kind of first draft um, as, as orally delivered lectures, when I came to collect the books, the, the th pieces for the book, I essentially rewrote all of them, mm. um, just because on the page is different than in the audience, in, in the auditorium, you know. Uh, you, can't, you can't just take something you said aloud and put it on a book and it's fine, you know, because uh, it usually isn't. So, so yeah, I mean, I see those, uh, those lectures as being kind of first drafts of the, of the texts that are actually in, in the book. I mean, the, 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 the essay about Philip Roth that's in the book started, yeah. uh, started as a lecture. The, the essay about Kurt Vonnegut started as a lecture. Um, but it, they've been kind of reshaped for, for readers. I, I guess when I referred to the public intellectual, I, I didn't fully understand what you just described about the American commentary. But, but America is more welcoming of that sort of work than yeah. England is. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I mean just the, the thing that I like about, uh, I don't know about America, but the thing that I like about New York City as a, as a, yeah, as a yeah, location yeah. Um, is that it does open the door and let you in. You know, uh, uh, you, I mean, you, know you, can, you can arrive in New York with your suitcases and put the bags down at Grand Central Station or wherever it is that you arrive. And you're a New Yorker. You know, you, that nothing more is arrived of you. Uh, it, that nothing more is required of you than That's to be here. here yes. Than to be here. You know, and and that kind of open door attitude of the city, you know, uh, accounts for a lot of its quality. You know, uh, that I mean, most people who live in New York were not born here. No, of course. You know, you know and, and I mean, not just from abroad, but but from other parts of America as well. You know. Um, as the song goes, you know, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And, and, and that's very much a feeling about the city. You know? And it's actually rather wonderful at the moment to see it coming back to life. You know? because, for, because for the last, you know, year and a quarter or so, mm. we've all been in the middle of this, this nightmare of the, of the pandemic. And uh, New York is coming out of it, really, I have to say, let me not, let me touch wood and everything else inside, is coming out of it rather well. As is known. Yeah. Here, people are very, have been very serious about vaccination. Right. Uh, um, and, uh, and the city is very good at encouraging. For example, yesterday, the governor uh, announced that if you go to a game at Yankee Stadium and you have been vaccinated, there are going to be se se sections of the stadium set aside for people who've been vaccinated so that you can all sit together. Uh, and, and plus, if you haven't been vaccinated, there will be vaccination stations at the stadium. Oh, great, really. And if you get vaccinated there, you will be given a free ticket to another Yankee game. You know, so, That's an amazing idea, isn't it? Yeah, so, the, so, you know, people are trying all sorts of devices to persuade the, the let's say, that the hesitant uh, to, to be less hesitant. Carrots rather than sticks being something that they haven't quite got their head around here yet. So uh, as with so many other things, you were a very early adopter of coronavirus. You, you write powerfully about that as well. Yeah. I got it right at the beginning. I mean, <laughs> Before. I thought about a moment when people didn't even know how to be careful. Yes, you know? yes. Um, and, and I mean, I remember, I don't know exactly where I got it. Uh, it could have been walking down the street, you know, that I, I sure. don't know. Uh, but I do remember that the last time I went out to dinner at a restaurant, uh, I went to this restaurant called Lafayette, which is downtown in, in Manhattan. And, and it's quite a big restaurant, it's quite a large space. But when, when we got there, it was almost empty. I mean, there were about two or three tables at which there were people sitting and, and you know, 10 times that number of tables at which nobody was sitting. And that looked a bit scary. Yes. Um, and actually I looked at the wait staff and they looked a bit scared. 
And, and I remember saying, you know, should we, should we just go home? I mean, should we just not stay, not go to dinner? Just go home. And then we thought, look, you know, we're here. Let's have something to eat. Go, home, you know. And so we did stay and have a bite to eat. And two days later, I had coronavirus. Uh, so I'm telling myself that that may be where I got it, but I don't, I don't really know. Scary for I, you. I was incredibly bit. lucky. I mean, I, you know, because I, I have. Not a, I have my, a mild case of asthma anyway, and that that gives me an underlying condition. Mm. Um, and so, I'm, obviously, the thing I was most worried about was that it would affect my breathing. You know, and 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 the thing I was most lucky about is that it did not. Uh, so you know, I had a fever, and I, I felt weak, and I had a cough, and I had all that, but I didn't have trouble breathing, and so I didn't have to go to hospital. And then, then when you got the antibody confirmation for, from your doctor, there's a there's an almost childlike glee in the reporting of that in the book. Yeah, it was. It felt like, as like I said, I think it felt like a superpower. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, you had to go on being careful, but you just felt safer. Leave the cold behind and head to the warmer climes of Greece with up to 20% off flights and up to £200 off beach package holidays this summer. Book by 15th of February 2022 with EasyJet. Selected dates. Holidays at all protected. Holidays based on two adults and two children sharing one room. Limited availability. T's and C's apply at EasyJet.com. You're also right about how you'd never gone for that anything like that period of time without seeing your sons, without seeing your family. So given... Given that, and given what you said about New York, and given that you've also lived in India and England, do you have a concept of home in your head? Yeah, but I, it's a multiple concept. Right. You know, I, 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 and I think that's not so unusual in these, in these days when, when so many people migrate, you know, uh, mm. that you think of many places as home. You know, I, 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 mean, if I've, I mean, I've lived in London longer than I've lived anywhere else. Sure. So, so if I'm in London, I feel very comfortable and at home, you know, uh, and, uh, and now I've lived here in New York for what, 21 years. You know? yes. so, so I feel the same here. And, and actually when I'm able to go to India, which of course right now nobody is, mm. um, for tragic reasons. Um, but when I, well, particularly when I go to Bombay, you know, I, I think the, the place you grow up, the place where you were born and raised, you know, uh, has a hold on you and a sense of home that nowhere else does. You know, uh, uh, so I think of it as that. I think of it as the the place that I grew up. You know, and, and it's like that kind of home. Uh, but I don't see it as a place that I would particularly live in again. Okay. Because you know? I think sometimes it, you know it's not even a question of countries. Childhood to adulthood is often a process of leaving home. You know, I mean, most of us at some point leave the home in which we were brought up, you know, otherwise we're a little bit sad if we don't. <laughs> or, or an aristocrat. Or very rich. <laughs> <laughs> or with an extremely large house that you can't afford to keep up. Yes, there is um, that. Um, but, I mean, I think it's natural for people to leave home, you know, cool. and, and to make a home of their own. You know, and so I think of all those places as home. When you were growing up, as a very young boy, were you aware that you were going to be sent to school in England? No, did, did... For, no, for a long time, no. I mean, it was very okay. quite, it was in a way quite last minute. You know, I, and I think, I think when I was about 12, my father said to me that he'd been looking into it. And that basically almost all the schools said, you know, you should have put his name down at birth. Yes. Um, and... And just one school, which was rugby school, said, well, if he can come up to the standard in the common entrance exam, then, then we'll, we can have a place for it. And so he, my father sort of told me that, but I wasn't pushed to do it. You know, he said, he said this is just available. If you're interested, we can pursue this, you know. Uh, but if you're not interested, never mind. You know? and, and, and my mother was against it from the beginning. She didn't want me to go live thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and something about me said I would do it. And actually, I quite, I find that quite mysterious because it isn't that I had been an unhappy, as I've just said to you, I had a happy childhood. I, you know, I was, I was living in a place that I liked. I had, my family situation was very happy. Um, I had lots of friends. I liked my school. You know, I had every reason to stay put. And yet something said, yeah, I'll go. 
And, and I don't know quite what that was. You know, part of me thinks that it was some unsuspected spirit of adventure. Uh, and part of me thinks it's because I'd read a lot of English schoolboy life books, you know, um, and was maybe seduced by literature. Uh, discovered rather rapidly when I got there that it wasn't like that at all. No, not a tiny bit. Um, but yeah, that 12 year old kid. And then, I mean, then when I was 13, I suppose, I, I, I did the common entrance exam and, 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 and you know, came up to standard. And so, so I came to England. Do, do you look back on that, that five year period happily? I mean, it, it, it's a weird place, boarding school, because you describe the brutality to people that have never been near it and you completely fail to convey, or I do anyway, all of the good bits, because it, it sounds so odd to the uninitiated. I mean, I, I wasn't happy. That, I mean, it was a single sex school at that time. Now it's not. Yes. You know, I, I think it might be just more normal now than yeah. having hundreds and hundreds of boys of between 13 and 18 locked up in boarding houses. Um, what I remember most positively is the actual quality of the teaching. Uh, I remember being having brilliant teachers, you know, um, many of whom inspired. But for example, I had a French teacher. I, when I came into his class, I was like bottom of the class in French. There was no good at it at all. And after one year in his class, I was top of the class in French. Uh, because and it's all completely down to him. He just actually inspired me with the language. Uh, his name was Mr. Lewis. And his, because his initials were PG, he was known as the pig. <laughs> Pig Lewis. Anyway, he, he inspired me to, to learn French. Uh, I had history teachers who were brilliant and who, as a result of whom, I ended up studying history at Cambridge. Not, not English. I was surprised by that because of, you know, the, the clear passion for literature. Did, did that kick in at rugby as well or did that come well, later? I, mean, I was a big reader always, you know. Of course, uh, but there's a difference between reading and being able to write you know, 5,000 words of, of erudition on the novels of Samuel Beckett, isn't it? Yeah, I'm really pleased I never had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, I think that the study of history has been actually very important for me as a, as a writer, you know, because a, a lot of my books have taken on the question of history and, uh, and its relationship to the lives of individuals, you know, um, and... You know, the big question that history asks of us is, is do, we, do we have any power? Do we make our world or does the world simply impose itself upon us? You know, um, what, is the, what is the relationship between society and the individual? You know, can we change the world you know, or, or can we not? Um, does the world change us? You know, uh, what is that transaction? You know, between between the big world, the big narrative inside which we live, and the little narrative of our lives. You know, and um, and I think studying history gave me a real sense of that. You know, and and I think it's actually been very helpful in a lot of things I've written. Uh, have you been following the, the the brouhaha over here about the expansion of history at things like national trust properties and and? No, I haven't, as a matter of fact. I just saw something about cutting budgets for arts education, which... Uh, that, yeah, that's a, that's a slightly different thing. It's a very weird, and I mention it because I interviewed the professor who, who, who is leading the programme for the National Trust mm. on this series a couple of weeks ago, and she mentioned your essay about empire from 1982 as having been something of a canary down the coal mine for what she's experiencing. So the, the sort of right-wing newspapers are very, very cross that National Trust properties are displaying information about the relationship between the money that built the houses and the slave trade, as if it's Absolutely. an assault upon values. But you were ahead of the game on that as well. I remember being very struck by, I mean, I had, I've had two sons who have gone through the English school system mm -hmm. you know, and, and they went to good schools. You know, um, and yet neither of them received a single hour of education about the British Empire. You know, so the most important single fact about the history of the of of, of, a, of the United Kingdom, which is that for two hundred years it ruled a very large chunk of the world, you know, that was something which was not taught not even once. And as a result, you bring up a, a, a generation or you bring up generations completely ignorant of that past. Yes, it makes it impossible for them to understand the present. Why are all these people of West Indian and African and Indian 
origin walking around the streets of London. You know, why is that? Well, yes. it's because you were over there taking all their money. Where, where do you think the resistance and the reluctance comes from? I mean, be, I, I can't stress to you enough how bonkers it has been in, in the last six months or so. The, I think it's a kind of shame. War. I think it's a kind of shame right. about, about the past. You know, and I mean, it's not unlike the refusal until quite recently, the refusal in the United States to discuss slavery. Right. Uh, uh, because I, you know, the, the, the great, the, the two original sins of this country were, first of all, the extermination of a lot of the original population. Um, and, and secondly, the, 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 the import of slaves. Uh, and even most, I mean, like two years ago, there was this thing called the 1619 Project here, mm. which, which, which was built around the fact that it was the 500th anniversary, uh, sorry, 400th anniversary uh, of the first slave ship arriving. And it took that as the starting point of the American narrative, rather than 1776 and the Declaration of Independence. Right. You know? um, yeah. And so actually the story doesn't begin there, it begins right. over here. Yeah. You know? um, and, and you have no idea how much right-wing hatred has been aimed at the 1619 Project. You know? um, just because that's not supposed to be what we talk about. It's a mythology, almost, yeah. that's been challenged. I mean, this is, you know, one of the things I think is happening now is the creation in many countries, including both the UK and the United States, of a mythology about the past in order to justify actions in the present. Yes. Um, I, I mean, I think the whole Brexit thing was based on the creation of a kind of golden age myth of, of, of what the country used to be like before all these inconvenient foreigners messed it up. <laughs> yeah. and, and if we could just get rid of the inconvenient foreigners, then we could go back to you know, wearing straw boaters and punting down the river <laughs> you know, and, and eating crumpets yeah. and, and you know, being English. Um, I do think it's about being English because the Scots didn't think this, and you know, and, and so, well, bits of the Welsh did, and the, the Irish didn't really think it. Um, but it was a kind of myth, a kind of almost P.G. Woodhouse myth of England, yes. you know, that we could just get back to if we just get rid of the foreigners, you know. And and it's the same, you know, in America with with the, the red hat. You know, I, I always wanted to ask people wearing that slogan. The, when was America great? What is the moment of greatness to which we should seek to return? You know, yeah. Was it, for example, mm. when there were still slaves? Was it when before women had the vote? Uh, was it before the civil rights movement? Uh, was it when homosexuality was illegal? You know, when's the great moment? You know, because of course the thing about the golden age myths is that there never was a golden age. Right. You know, um, so it's a it's a fairy tale about the past, which you use to justify what you're doing in the present, and, and which is which is why the, the 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 resistance to learning more about the past can be so furious. I think Cicero said something about countries that don't know their own history are sort of infantilized forever, and and that yeah. fits, doesn't it, at the moment? I, and I think you know that's one of the things I think about why I so value the fact that I studied history. Right. Yes. Because what it does is it is tell you that the past is important. And our Midnight's Children, of course, is, I, yeah. I, I mean, you say a couple of times in the new book, in a couple of different pieces about, I hope I'm not paraphrasing too bluntly, but somehow fiction can tell more truth sometimes than nonfiction. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think one of the strange things about this moment, when there's been such an assault on truth, mm. you know, um, I mean, I think it's very important that we do something about that, and that we that, that that we have to try and rebuild amongst ourselves as as societies a belief in reality, you know. And and um, strangely, what literature at its best—not all literature—but what literature at its best can do is to create a kind of vision of the real which the reader accepts. You know, and uh, you, you read the book and you think, yeah, that's how it is. You know, this is how we are with each other. This is what we do with, do to each other and why, you know. And mm. and doesn't matter if it's a 
fantasy novel or a kitchen sink realist novel. You know, the, the manner doesn't matter. What matters is that intention to say, this is what it's like. You know, and, and so I think one of the things that literature can do in a moment like this is to try and rebuild that sense uh, of the real, you know, um, and I hope anyway, you know, yeah. I, don't want to, I don't want to overstate because, you know, there are things that literature can't do, which is usually doesn't change the world. I mean, even magic realism can't, can't actually do magic, can it? Not really. <laughs> and there are one or two books in the history of literature that have had an immediate and profound effect. And, I mean, the one that springs to mind is Uncle Tom's Cabin, you know, okay. um, of course. Which, uh, which had a very big effect on people on the slavery discussion. You know? In yes. fact, there's a funny story, which I believe is a true story, that, that when Abraham Lincoln w met the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, he said to her, oh, so you're the little woman who started this big war. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's, really, that's really special. Yeah, and I mean, there's a sense in which he was. When then did your ambition begin to develop, to, to add to the canon? Well, well, well. You know, I, I, when I left university, I had, I had kind of one and a half plans. I mean, one, one was to try and write, and the other was to try, the half was to try and be an actor. Yes. Uh, and that didn't, that didn't go so well. Uh, so How hard did you try? I did, you know, I mean, at th that time, the late, the end of the 60s and the early 70s, there was a very, very active um, fringe in London yeah. theatre. There were a lot of fringe venues in which a lot of people who became like major playwrights, you know, kind of like David Hare, Trevor Griffiths, Howard mm -hmm. Brenton, you know, people like that were just sort of cutting their teeth, you know. Um, and so the work was actually of quite high quality. And, and a lot of like West End actors, when they weren't in a play, they knew that the kind of interesting stuff was happening on the fringe and they, and, and they would want to come and just take a role for a few weeks in something, you know. So, so actually it was highly creative and very exciting. You know? And, and I, there was a place called the Oval House in Kennington, which started out being a youth club and had a kind of rather brilliant uh, guy in charge of it called Peter Oliver, who, who started using its kind of hall as a theatre space. And, and, and a lot of those fr fringe theatre groups came and worked there. People like, you know, the People Show and, and yeah. things like that. And, and I did some stuff there. Um, what, was, what was your greatest role? What do you look back on most proudly? Well, <laughs> there was a play written by the college friend of mine, Dusty Hughes, who went on to be a, a, a professional playwright. Um, but he wrote a play in which he wanted me to play an agony aunt. Um, and because, of course, one of the things about agony aunts is that although they take female names, many of them are actually men. Mm. Uh, so I was supposed to wear a long black dress and a blonde wig, <laughs> but be obviously male. Yes. Uh, and, uh, to be this ag to be this kind of dear Abby kind of agony aunt. Um, thank God there are no photographs. <laughs> so you think. Right. <laughs> the search the search begins now. So 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 when then did that? Uh, I mean, you wanted to be a writer, a novelist. Uh, that it was it was yeah. you wanted to join those ranks. Yeah. I, mean, I, you... quite, I quite rapidly. I wanted. I was trying to write sort of early pathetic versions of something that didn't work out. Right. Um, and I, I quite, I mean, by about, I mean, by about, I mean, I left Cambridge in 68, so I suppose that about a year and a half or so, I was occasionally doing things in, in, in these fringe productions. Okay. Always as an actor, not as a director. Um, and I just realized I wasn't that good, you know, I just thought, because, because when, you, when you're surrounded by really gifted actors, you know, um, first of all, one of the things they do is they make you look good. So, but, but, um, but, but you realize immediately that they're doing it, not you. You do know the difference, don't you? You do know the difference. You, you, can't, you can't kid yourself, especially if you're, I think if you're bright, you know, you're, you're bright enough to recognize the superior talent on the stage next yeah, to you. But, you know, I mean, I think I was better at comedy than tragedy. I think that's true. Yes. But, uh, but um, anyway, I, I thought I'd we'll stick to the other job. Leave the cold behind and head to the warmer climes of Greece with up to 20% off flights and up to £200 off beach package holidays this summer. Book by 15th of February 2022 with EasyJet. 
Dates, selected dates, holidays at all protected. Holidays based on two adults and two children sharing one room. Limited availability. T's and C's apply at easyjet.com. After the first book bombed, as, as you've alluded to yourself, how, how did you pick yourself up and dust yourself down after that? Because well, presumably shock, get, uh, getting published was the dream come true in a, in a yes, sense. Yes, getting published was a dream come true and then the publication was a rude awakening. <laughs> uh, and I mean, I had, I had a while of just feeling very upset about it. Yeah. Um, and, and then I thought to ask myself, okay, never mind what they say about it. What do you think is wrong with it? You know, uh, uh. And, and what do you think you should do that would be better than that? And, and, um, and out of the, that questioning, that questioning really made me understand that what I had to do is understand myself better. Right. You know, and, and, and that took me back to childhood and understanding the world that I'd come from. Uh, and then I thought I would write a novel about childhood. Uh, and that, that was as much as I thought. I had no idea of the kind of much larger canvas that, that Midnight Children eventually was written on. I just thought I'm going to write a novel about growing up in Bombay, you know, just that. And, and that turned into Midnight Children. Which is, I mean, I, I think it, it's, it's not even an opinion. It's a matter of fact. Well, one of the greatest novels of, of the 20th century. Did you, did you know? I, it, when I finished it, I had this yeah. strange double feeling that on, on the one hand, I thought, I thought, you know, as far as I can tell, this is a good book. Yeah. But I also was aware of the fact that my track record was very bad. So it's better than the last one. <laughs> yeah. But I thought, you know, I wasn't at all sure that I knew what a good book was. I mean, right. thought, you know, I think, I think, the, I think, and I remember saying to myself, if nobody agrees with me that it's a good book, then maybe I'm not, I'm not able to judge what a good book is and I should do something else. You know? uh, so, yeah. so it was a kind of Hollywood or bust moment, you know, and, and fortunately, it found very, very good early readers. Very, very quickly. So was, was it incremental or was, were there milestones of recognition that made you go, no, I, 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 drove, I think I've cracked it. Well, my editor, Liz Calder, who had worked at Victor Golang's, where, which was where my first novel was published, um, in the interim, while I was writing Midnight Children, had moved from Golang's to Jonathan Cape, which in those days was an independent publishing mm -hmm. house. Now it's part of Random House. Um, and so I sent it to her because she was a friend and, and she really liked it, but because we were friends, she thought she should get other opinions. Um, so it, she sent it out for a reader's report and the first reader's report was very, very negative. Oh gosh. Yeah. It, it said the author should concentrate on short stories till he has mastered the novel form. <laughs> and Liz, was upset because she liked the book. So she sent it out for a second reader's report, which was very positive. Oh, wow. um, and so there was one of each. Yes. And so then Tom Mashler, who was in those days the boss of Cape, a legendary publisher. Yes. Uh, so she, Tom came into her office. I know this from her. You know, Tom came into her office and said, so what do you got? You know, what's going on? And she said, well, there's this book that I really like it. It's got one bad reader's report and one good reader's report. Um, and he said, well, give me 100 pages. And so she gave him a chunk of the manuscript and he took it home overnight. And he came back into the office the next day and came into her room and he said, if you haven't bought this book in one hour, you're fired. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> that's how it happened. And I had no idea that there had been a negative reader's report. They concealed it from me. You know? yes. And it came out like after the book won the Booker Prize. Like almost, I think, the next day, maybe. Really? There was like a piece in the Evening Standard uh, which said that there had been a negative readers report about it. And I thought it was crap, you know, and I remember calling, <laughs> calling Liz at, and said, what's this nonsense in the paper, you know, about a bad readers report. And she said, no, actually, you know what, it's not nonsense. Um, so I only found out about it as it were after the event. And, and th does it, does something shift inside you when you enjoy that sort of, it's not success, success as much as validation, I think. Yeah, it felt like that. I mean, it certainly, it just was, a, of course, it was, it was exciting. And, and, and uh, I mean, it was enormously exciting. Sure. The, the, the thing I had never expected was a bestseller. You know, it just never, never crossed my mind uh, that it would be 
a book that sold in just in England alone more than a million copies, you know, um, and, and and that was then. I mean, I, now I don't even know how much it sold. Sure. Um, but what it meant was, I had an enormous feeling of relief. Uh, I just thought, oh, I can actually do this thing that is the thing I've only thing I've really ever wanted to do with my life. You know, uh, it turns out I actually can do it. You know, and that now. I can write another book and there's a very serious chance that people will publish it and that it'll be taken seriously. You know? and so I just thought, okay, I'm not an idiot. You know, I'm not, del I'm not deluding myself yes. uh, that I can do something which I actually can't do. Um, and so a sense of arrival, has it lived up to your early expectations? Well, I mean, it's a long life, you know. Yes, and, cool. and there have been good moments and bad moments, you know, um, and I guess that's to be expected. You know? And that leads us, in, in conclusion, to, to, to the new collection, which is, well, it's eclectic to say the least. I, I, I hope you don't mind. I've not read it chronologically. I've been dipping in and out of it, which Nobody I think ever reads it chronologically. No, it really lends itself, though, to, to looking at the index or looking at the contents page. Think, well, have a look at that now. For yeah, exactly. Well, that's, I mean, I, everybody reads books of essays like that. It's completely mm. normal including me. Yes. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's work that, it's not just work that's been done over a you know, fifth decade and a half or so. Yeah. But it contains a lot, for me, it contains a lot of the underpinning of all my work. You know, mm. that's, that's the kind of, why does my work come out the way it comes out? You yes. know, I, I, think, I think the answer to that is, is, in, is in this book. You know, and if, I think people have, it's interesting to me that people have become very interested in, in the craft of writing. You know, uh, I mean, one of the things that, that readers seem most interested in is how do you do it? You know, just right. te technically, how do, you, yes. how do you do it? You know, and, and what are the kind of ideas and techniques and et cetera? How, do you, how, is, how is it that the book gets written? You know, and people seem to become very interested in that. And I think so. So there's a lot of that in here, and, and I hope that's interesting to people. Well, there's, there's a lot more than that in there as well. I mean, just you mentioned a moment ago how how Brenton, the little passage on on you relating what he thinks Shakespeare did in terms of liberating English writers for generations, centuries, in fact, in a way that writers in the French tradition, in back to Racine, simply haven't haven't enjoyed. There's so much. That's what I mean about it, dipping in and out of it and, and delighting in the it discovery. It gives us this colossal gift of saying that a book, a, a work of literature can be many things at the same time. Yeah. So that Hamlet, you know, can be a ghost story, a love story, a political story, a murder story, um, you know, all at the same time. Um, yes. and, and if you know how to do it, which you, I mean, kind of the trick is you have to be Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do, when you were... That freedom of form that Shakespeare has, you know, yes. and, that is, and that is his gift to us, you know. You can do, do it like this. I remember once watching the great Indian film director, Satyajit Ray, I was able to go on location while he was directing one of his last films. And the way he did it was he would, you'd stand the actors in a circle and he'd say, you stand here, you stand there, you stand there, that's where you're going to be. And then he would act out the entire scene. I mean, literally jumping from position to position, you know, he would <laughs> male parts, female parts, he'd act the whole thing out. And then he'd say to them, do it like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a um, final question. Do, 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 you, do you have any ambitions left? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, I do. I mean, for instance, I've just done something which I've never done in my life before, which is I've written a play. Ah. And I mean, I, you know. Did, have you, did you write the lead role for yourself? If only. The play, <laughs> the play is about Helen of Troy, so I don't think I could take it. <laughs> I don't know. You've still got the wig. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way, it feels like coming full circle to what we were talking about to those very early days at, in, at the Oval House in Kennington, you know. Um, and, and I've always loved theatre, and I've never written for it. Uh, I mean, I had some consulting role in the plays that were made out of Midnight's Children and, and Haroon and the Sea of Stories, but I didn't actually write it. Okay. This time, 
I have written it. And now, of course, lunatic to write a play when every theatre is shut. Of course. <laughs> so I hope it'll be on at some point. Is, are you pleased with it? Are you... I mean, you know, I kind of am pleased with it, but that's not what matters. What matters is if you're pleased with it. Of course, if everybody else has a view. Yeah. We should look forward to that. In the meantime, um, Languages of Truth, Essays 2003 to 2020, will be out by the time this interview is, is, is published. Salman Rushdie, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been real fun. <laughs> <laughs>